Today's story is sometimes called one of the last great mysteries of the September 11th terrorist attacks. When Sneha Ann Phila, a married doctor, went missing on September 10, 2001, for years no one knew what happened, with the truth being obscured by the media outlets, family members, and even her own husband. So grab your knitting or your vice of choice and join me as we explore the disappearance of Sneha and Phila. My name is Sophia Talley and this is True Crime and Net. Sneha Ann Phillip was born on October 7, 1969 in Kerala, India. She, she immigrated into the U.S. with her parents, where she eventually graduated from John Hopkins University to pursue a career in medicine. Before graduating from the Chicago School of Medicine in 1995, she met another medical student named Ron Lieberman. They bonded over their creative outlets, with Ron being a musician and Sneha a painter, and they soon began dating. Sneha even took a year off of school to travel around Italy, so that way her and Ron can graduate together. They married in May 2000 and moved to an apartment in Battery Park in New York City, where they settled down into their jobs with Sneha working in internal medicine at St. Vincent Hospital in Staten Island and with Ron working in emergency medicine at Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx. On September 10th, 2001, Sneha had a day off from work. On that day, Ron says that they met for lunch and then they went back home to their apartment before Ron left for work. And Ron says, luckily I forgot my keys, so I had to come back in and I got to kiss her again. After mulling around her home, straightening up and instant messaging her mother, at around 4 p.m., Sneha dressed in a brown button-down dress and sandals and left the apartment to run some errands. Sneha dropped off her dry cleaning, then she did some shopping at Century 21. For those who are not from the New York area, this is a discount department store and they have really good shoes. But Sneha was seen on surveillance footage shopping for lingerie, pantyhose, and linens with another woman, and she paid with Ron's American Express card. That night, around midnight, Ron came home to an empty apartment. He wasn't concerned as Sneha often stayed out with friends and family, and though they agreed that she should call when she stays out late, she often didn't. And before I go on, guys, just a quick PSA, always tell everyone where you're going to be. When I was a teenager, I used to sneak out places and I wasn't supposed to be, but I always left a paper trail by paying with my card. So if you have no one to tell, just swipe that card. But I'm getting off topic here. So he just went to sleep because next morning he had to get to work early. But the next morning on September 11, 2001, Sneha was still not home. And at this point, Ron was just annoyed because he still had not heard from Sneha. He figured that she was staying with her brother John in the West Village or her cousin Anu who lived close to them. Again, this behavior was not really noteworthy and he rushed off to work because he had a work meeting at 8 a.m. and just couldn't wait up for her. When the meeting ended at 9 a.m., Ron saw that all of his coworkers were gathered around a television and by now you can guess what was on the TV. The first plane has hit the World Trade Center, which is only two blocks away from his apartment in Battery Park. Panicked, he calls home, but no one answered. He then called Sneha's mother and brother, but neither had heard from Sneha either. Just for reference here, New York City was in a chaotic panic, and in the middle of it all, Ron could not locate his wife Sneha. However, being an ER doctor, Ron 
didn't really have time to look. He had to stay at the hospital just in case there was an overflow of patients who were injured in the World Trade Center attacks. But by 3 p.m., there just still wasn't any overflow of patients. So Ron hitched a ride with an ambulance that was heading downtown. Remember, he is in the Bronx, which is the upper part of the city. And Battery Park is the literal tip of New York almost. So he had to go all the way across the city. The ambulance ride took six hours due to crowds of people fleeing in the opposite direction away from the World Trade Center. When he finally reached their apartment building, the building's electricity was out and he couldn't get the electric sliding doors open. And with New York City presumably being under attack, he couldn't call the police. And so he spent that night on a friend's couch, just lying awake, worrying about his wife, Sneha. The next morning, Ron was finally able to enter the building. The apartment was silent and covered in soot that blew in from a broken window. The only signs of life came from little paw prints in this suit left behind by their two kittens, Figa and Callie, but there was no sign of Sneha. Ron reported Sneha missing on September 12, 2001, fully knowing that the police would not be able to do much in the wake of 9-11. And he was right. The police suggested that Sneha died in the attacks. But when Ron said that there was a possibility that she was just missing, pointing out the fact that he hadn't seen or heard from Sneha since the 10th, Ron quotes the police who said, that's between you and her. The police were sure, though, without, a, without an investigation, that Sneha somehow got hurt during the attacks and possibly died. Ron decided not to wait for the police to do their investigation, and instead he began to work on finding Sneha on his own. He posted flyers around New York City and visited the 9-11 Help Center at the Lexington Avenue Armory to drop off flyers. There were television cameras there ready to interview people about their 9-11 stories, but they weren't interested in Sneha's story because she went missing on the 10th and her disappearance was most likely unrelated to the attacks. So Ron decided to do something that will come back to haunt him, to say it lightly. Ron called Sneha's brother, John, and convinced them to report Sneha missing to the media that were there at the 9-11 Help Center. However, he told John, just don't mention that she went missing on the 10th. John, though, decided it would be a better idea to lie about Sneha's involvement in the 9-11 attacks in order to bring more attention to her case. And so John tells the media, and this is a direct quote, I was on the phone with her and she told me she couldn't leave because people were hurt. She said, I have to help this person and that's the last thing I heard from her. End quote. In reality, John had not spoken to Sneha in two weeks. The false story ran on the news along with Sneha's photo, but of course nothing came of it. John began to realize that his mistake may have actually hindered Sneha's case. No kidding. And I completely understand where John is coming from here because wanting people to play it to pay attention to his sister's disappearance, you know, I get that and wanted to tell a lie just so that way people can recognize that she's missing and to look for her. Especially since Sneha did go missing. But lying about Sneha going missing while assisting survivors of the attack implies that she died in the attack and that we are looking for a body because if someone goes missing you know at ground zero during the attacks and they haven't been accounted for for a few days it's very unlikely that that person is still alive you're literally telling the public to search for remains if that makes sense because in reality Sneha went missing on the 10th which means that there's a chance that she could be somewhere else maybe not even in this city altogether so this lie, it, though it got the media attention, it also misdirected the search efforts for Sneha. 
Two weeks later, the lie came out via news stories, and some people began to wonder if Sneha was really missing at all. They just didn't know what to believe. Ron and Sneha's family continued to spread awareness by distributing flyers. And through American Express, Ron found out that Sneha made purchases on the 10th at a Century 21. Desperately, Ron began passing out flyers to other Century 21s in the area as the one that Sneha made their purchase at was closed due to it being so close to the World Trade Center, it was damaged. One flyer, which was handed out at a Century 21 in Brooklyn, got the attention of Sonia Mora, a shoe department sales clerk. She originally worked at the location that Sneha was seen at, but had to be relocated to Brooklyn after the attacks. Sonia remembered Sneha because she was a regular customer and noted that on the 10th, Sneha was shoplifting with a dark-skinned, possibly Indian woman. This led to Ron obtaining surveillance camera footage from the Century 21 that Sneha did visit, and it was there when he was able to find footage of Sneha shopping for a winter coat. But he just didn't see footage of the friend. The Century 21 lead was a dead end because the friend, if she was really there in the first place, never came forward. And according to Ron, the $500 worth of purchases that Sneha made that day never made it into the apartment. And this is big because Sneha was caught on surveillance footage holding what looked to be two shopping bags. So where were those bags? It almost suggested that she didn't make it home that night. Out of ideas, Ron hires a private investigator named Ken Gallant, and Gallant finds evidence that suggests that Sneha did in fact make it home that morning on the 11th. First, there was a phone call from their apartment to Ron's phone. Then Gallant finds footage from September 11th of a woman entering their apartment building and waiting by the elevator before exiting the building. The camera is facing the sliding doors and there is sunlight pouring in so you can just see a feminine figure with her hair up in a ponytail and in a dress similar to that in which Sneha was last seen wearing on the Century 21 footage. The video was timestamped at 8.43 a.m., three minutes before the first plane hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center. So to me, it seems as if, if this is Sneha, she possibly ran out of the building upon hearing the crash. And the family believes that this woman in the footage is in fact Sneha. And they note that the woman on camera has the same mannerisms as Sneha. And even as an outsider who never met Sneha, just looking at the footage, it does look like her figure and it could be her. The time in which this woman is caught on camera also suggests that it's Sneha because whenever Sneha would spend the night elsewhere, she would usually return home between 7 and 9 a.m. The one discrepancy, though, was that the woman in the surveillance footage was not holding shopping bags. Gallant began to believe that Sneha used the chaos of the 9-11 attacks to run away and start a new life elsewhere. Up until now, you may be wondering why Sneha would run away. She had a residency at a good hospital, she was supposedly in a happy marriage, and she lived in the beautiful and somewhat exclusive neighborhood of Battery Park. The thing is, you may have noticed so far that everything I said has been from Ron's perspective. After our new mission, we will dive deeper into what Sneha's life was really like. So for today's knitter mission, it is just me, myself, and I. I've decided to just have me on the show today because I have a few announcements to make pertaining to True Crime and Knit. So before I start showing you my knits, let me just let you know that our next episode, so the 10th episode, will be the season finale. I will be taking about a six-week break 
before coming back with 10 more episodes of True Crime in Knit. And I am so excited to get those to get that new content to you. If you are a Patreon member already, I still will be posting some unreleased clips from the show on my Patreon throughout that time. And along with some sneak peeks of the topics that I will be covering next season. But I just will be taking this break just to regroup and film some more episodes and to work on my upcoming book that I have coming up next year. And I'm going to talk more about that next season. So I just have a lot of things that I really want to give my attention to. And I don't want to show to lag behind because I'm putting my attention towards other things. Also, I really, really wanted this show to be seasons versus of every week a new episode just because it's hard to keep up as a mama. So that's what I'm going to do. And of course, I will let y'all know the exact day in which I will be coming back well in advance. If you would like more information about when season two will start, I, I highly recommend checking out the link to the show notes. Today, I am still working on my bikini bottoms. I'll show you them now. So let me describe those bikini bottoms for you. They are a taupe or khaki color with some magenta and lighter pink bobbles along the waistline. So it's pretty cute and fun and fresh. They look really big. And they look that big because they are knit with rayon, a made from bamboo and that's just really cellulistic fiber it's it's plant derived so what that means is that it doesn't have the same stretch as say acrylic or wool or even an elastic yarn i was using before it has no stretch so i really had to make it bigger but that's okay because i still got that nice elastic and that well it's not installed yet but i hope to install an elastic in this waistband this weekend so that way they'll stay up in the pool and i hope to wear these on my birthday which is on monday so we'll see if i can get the top done this weekend i think i can because it's a quick knit especially now that the pattern is actually written up so i'm super excited about that the top is going to be these two pink colors i have a light pink and a magenta for those who are just listening so yeah i'm just really excited to to get that going and to wear that for my birthday I really want to like go to the beach but I don't know we have to see the weather right now is currently yucky in Indiana it is hot but not hot enough for the beach it is too humid to survive and the sun isn't out so that's lame Oh, another project that I am currently working on is a purse. And I can't show you it now because for once in my life, I'm keeping this project a secret just because, I don't know, it, it just feels right. It just This is my first purse design and it just feels right to keep it a little bit under uh, hush hush. Mainly because I'm a little bit shy about it. Like, what if you guys don't like it? This is my first ever purse. I mean, I felt the same about the moxie bikini that I just designed, which is an actual bikini that you can wear in the water and everything. And I was so scared that nobody would want that. But you guys surprised me. But now I'm just scared that no one's going to want this purse. But this purse that I'm designing, I'm just going to let you know that it's going to be a felted wool purse knitted. So you knit it and then you felt it after you knit it. So that's way it's super sturdy it's gonna have some str great structure and it's gonna be so easy with very little to no sewing required and because it's a wool purse I actually invested in some really really cheap but 100% leather purse straps that I got from Amazon and I'm not gonna link these in anything yet just because I don't know if they're good or not. Like I would hate to recommend these and then it's terrible. But if you're not watching, it's literally just a purse strap for a shoulder bag and it's 100% leather. And I know that because I smelled it and it smells just like leather. And that's great because I don't like when knitted bags has a knitted strap. I It just seems, I don't know, it's just not my thing. I really want it to look like a designer bag like that's my goal to, to knit a bag that can rival designer bags 
and have a much smaller carbon footprint and to be easy to knit and accessible. So that's why I really wanted to do this with a leather strap. And the strap I think cost like eight to $10. It was very inexpensive and I found it on Amazon Prime, but um, you can totally get it from like a leather artist in your area as well if you wanna continue with the shop small, uh, low carbon footprint thing. But my favorite part of this project is that it doesn't require a lot of sewing. I actually cheated and I bought a purse liner and all it is is that it's like an organization purse liner. You can find it on Amazon. I love finding it on Etsy as well. They're very inexpensive. I found one made out of felt and I just wanted a felt because it kind of matches the material of the purse. I got one that's like a hot pink slash magenta color but what I really like about getting a like a purse liner or a purse organizer, whatever you may know it as, what I like about it is that it acts as a structural support system for the bag. So it'll keep that nice tote shape in the bag. It's I found one that's the perfect size for the bag that I designed. In the pattern, I will have links to small businesses that sell these same things. I just got it off of Amazon because I was in a super rush. Don't do what I did. I recommend the small businesses. They're just as good, if not better in some places. But I have found some small businesses on Amazon too that are also great. So don't forget about that. Like a lot of things on Prime, you know, are mass produced. But I've just recently purchased a buffalo skin toiletry bag off of a small business that was selling it on Amazon out of Chicago. And I bought it for a Father's Day gift from my father-in-law. But I was just really impressed that, you know, that you can find a small business on Amazon Prime even. It was next day shipping. Okay, I ordered that thing on the Saturday before Father's Day and I got it or he got it on Father's Day. So that's amazing. So yeah, and that is on the Knitter Mission and what I have been working on. And now let's get back to the story. We left off with private investigator Ken Gowan considering the possibility that Sneha left on her own accord to begin a new life, possibly using the 9-11 attacks as a cover to disappear. But why would Sneha disappear? In the months leading up to her disappearance, Sneha was really struggling with life in general. Before her job as a resident student at St. Vincent's, Sneha interned at Cabrini Medical Center, who after her first year working there, she was fired because she was continuously late for work and because, and I quote, alcohol related issues, end quote. After this, Sneha went to a bar with her coworkers and she complained to police that one of the other interns groped her. However, police found that this claim was false. And the thing is, falsely reporting an incident is a misdemeanor in New York. But they offered to drop the charges if she just recanted her complaint. But Sneha stuck to her story and she was jailed overnight as a result, which side note, I don't think was fair because if this person did in fact assault her and then she gets jail time. But I don't know the full story there. There wasn't a lot there other, th other than the fact the police didn't believe the assault happened. And I don't know what, what information they had to say that. But what if they were wrong and then they just jailed someone who was innocently trying to report a sexual assault? But losing her residency at Cabrini seemed to send Sneha on a downhill spiral. She began to frequent gay and lesbian bars and would go home with the women that she met. This is why Ron was not initially surprised by her disappearance on September 10th through the morning of the 11th. On one incident, Sneha came home covered in paint one morning after going 
home with an artist the night before. On another incident, Sneha's brother John walked in on her. Get this. He walked in on Sneha and his girlfriend having sex. Mind you, John denies that he ever said this and claims that the police fabricated this story. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it just seems pretty creative of a police officer to fabricate this days in our lives esque scenario. And if they did, like 10 out of 10 for creativity, because how would you even think about that storyline? You know, like how, like, maybe you would say something like, oh, she was caught doing drugs, something a little bit less uh, days of our lives esque. That being said, I do not give much weight to anything that John or Ron says because it is clear that they are willing to say anything just to get Sneha's story out there. And they are also just biased just in the fact that they are her family and loved ones. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, Sneha gets another residency at St. Vincent's, and this is the job that she had at her disappearance. But remember when I said that she had a couple of days off? Well, she was actually suspended from work at the time for missing her meeting with a substance abuse counselor. In fact, on the morning of September 10th, 2001, Sneha had to go to court to plead not guilty for filing that quote-unquote false sexual assault complaint on her co-worker at her previous job. Ron actually spent that morning in court with Sneha, where witnesses claimed that they got into a heated argument. Ron was yelling because he was upset that Sneha was abusing drugs and alcohol, and he accused her of sleeping with other people, both men and women, and Sneha was actually seen storming out of court and didn't leave with John. So they did not leave together, and there was no romantic kiss goodbye before work, as Ron claims in his original statement. So obviously, Ron and the police do not agree with each other's accounts, and it didn't help that the police were finding this out at the same time that Ron and his PI, Ken Gallant, began to put together their own belief of what happened to Sneha that day. This was their hypothesis, okay? Sneha spent the night with the friend that she was seen shopping with at Century 21. She returned home at 8.43, and they do believe that it is her on that surveillance footage in her building's lobby. When the plane hit, she ran out to see what it was, and maybe she just started to help. But she just died during the attacks, possibly when the second plane hit. And though this theory wasn't perfect. Remember the woman on the surveillance footage was not even holding shopping bags. It was enough to get Sneha's name on the official list of 9-11 victims. This plausible account gave the family closure and they actually had a ceremony in September 2002 where they buried an urn filled with ashes from Ground Zero in honor of Sneha. Just to give more context here, 40% of the victims of the 9-11 attacks have not been identified as of 2016. There are remains of over 1,000 victims that are still have not been identified as today in 2021. Many of the remains have been damaged by fuel and fire, and in some cases, there just wasn't enough to test. To many families, ash found at Ground Zero was the only remains that they can bury. So in this case, it was not so far-fetched to not have any remains. A lot of people just seem to vanish that day, and some people even refer to that day as the Great Vanishing. But just as Neha's family was gaining some closure from this whole experience, the police was just not satisfied with this story that Sneha died in 9-11. Police felt that because of Sneha's troubled life, there was a chance that she ran away the day before the attacks 
or even during the attack. Originally, P.I. Ken thought this as well, but then he realized upon doing further investigation that this wasn't the most likely case. Nothing was taken from the apartment that would aid someone in running away. Sneha's passport, driver's license, credit cards, even her glasses. Uh, Sneha wore contacts, so even her glasses were left behind in the apartment building. So sure, she may leave all important identification, but her glasses, like what happens when your contacts run out? You're going to need to see with your glasses sometime. So... Ken even did a sweep of her computer's hard drive, and he didn't find any evidence that suggested that Sneha was planning to run away. Despite this, Sneha's name was removed from the official list of victims in January 2004. Sneha's family, though, was not having any of this. The police account did not match what they believed happened and also they felt as if the police was exaggerating her struggles. The family understandably looked at Sneha's troubles with rose-colored glasses and felt as if it wasn't nearly as bad as what the police claimed it was. Ron claimed that she frequented gay clubs because she didn't want to get hit on while she hung out. He felt that the police was judging their lifestyle and I'm inclined to believe with him. I believe that the police were judging but the thing is the police have evidence. They have paperwork from Sneha's jobs and witness testimony and they also lack the biases that family often have. However, I do think that they put a lot of stock in her troubled life. Sure, Sneha was struggling, but in New York, everyone is struggling. There was just not enough evidence that she ran away. There was nothing taking that she would need. No one saw her leave. It's just no one heard her talk about running away. There just was no evidence that would come to that conclusion. Also, if she did run away, it would have had to be the day of the attacks because remember, Ron received a phone call from home that morning. That would mean someone, most likely Sneha, the only one that lived there with Ron, was home that day at some point. And this would then point to the idea that Sneha used the attacks to run away. But this would also give her little time to do so. New York City was a chaotic scene that day with many commuters stranded there overnight due to the city being literally on lockdown. It's just plausible that she was still able to leave in the middle of terrorist attacks. But chances are she never even thought about leaving. I feel like most New Yorkers on that day was in a very primal survival mode and it just doesn't make any sense for someone to be like, hey, I can use this as an opportunity to run away. I don't understand on what universe would someone be able to think that clearly when it feels like the sky is falling. Especially when it is just so hard to leave the city on 9-11. Most people, if they did end up leaving out of the borough that they were in, they had to do this on foot. So that would mean she would have to walk all the way to who knows where, Staten Island. She wasn't getting into Jersey, okay? So I just don't understand where she would go. And so the family fought to have Sneha's name re-added to the list of victims for four years. And finally, on January 31st, 2008, a judge ruled that it was highly probable that Sneha did die during the 9-11 attacks. The judge also dismissed the NYPD report claiming that a lot of their claims were hearsay. And you know, I have to agree with them. I do think that a lot of what the police mucked up on Sneha's private life was true, but it just doesn't matter because at the end of it all, none of these claims contributed to Sneha running away. I mean, all it did was just describe a very sad woman who was struggling with addiction and sexuality. It didn't show a woman who had a plan or ever spoke about running away. 
Sneha is declared the 2,751st victim of the 9/11 attacks. As of today, Sneha's family is just hopeful that one day her remains, or maybe even her jewelry, will be identified. Up until then, they honor her by keeping her old room in their home, as she left it, with some added trinkets such as diplomas and photos to remember her by. Her family visit the National September 11th Memorial every year on her birthday, and in. Sneha's birthplace of Kerala, India. Two memorial funds have been established in her name, and this helps pay for medical care for those in need. So this is the case of Sneha and Philip, and this one had so many twists and turns. And I'm just curious to know what you think. So leave a comment if. You are watching on YouTube, or even just leave a comment in the show notes because I am just curious because I really don't know what happened to Sneha. Oh, you can also comment in the Discord as well because of that phone call that Ron received from home on September 11th. That phone call makes me believe that she was home that day, and I think she was probably watching the news, and maybe she ran out to help. Uh, the victims. I Maybe mean, she ran out to help, just like so many others. Maybe the woman in the building surveillance tape wasn't her. You know, like you just, because we're just not even sure if that was even her on that film. Maybe they just missed her on film. She could have went in on a different time and was just at home, getting ready for her day. I will post all of the surveillance footage and stills and everything in the show notes, so that way you guys can make your own conclusions. This case just haunts me all the time. Even though she is declared dead, I'm still going to list her physical description just because you never know because she, her remains haven't been identified and she just hasn't been accounted for yet. So maybe she is out there and maybe she has an odd story of. Being hit with rubble and losing her memory, or she maybe she did run away. Maybe the police were correct. Maybe they had information that they couldn't include in the report because they didn't have substantial evidence. So anyway, here is Sneha's physical description. She is an Asian female, black hair, brown eyes, and she is native of India. Some agencies spell her name, her middle name. With an e, so they spell it a n n e instead of an without the e, and she has a mole on her left cheek. Her ears are pierced, and she wears contact lenses. Sneha may use her husband's last name Lieberman. Her toenails were painted purple at the time of her disappearance, but she would be fifty one today, and who knows if we would even recognize her upon seeing her. So that's the case of Sneha and Phillips. Thank you for listening today. My name is Sophia Talley, and this is True Crime in Net. For more information and for show notes, please visit www.thedrunkknitter.com/truecrime.